about his coming at the end of the age. Did he mean by that phrase, the end of the age, the end of world history? Or was he talking more specifically about the end of the Jewish age? That's one of the critical points that uh, are in dispute here with respect to the time frame references of New Testament eschatology. I'd like to read a portion of the text of Matthew for you from a, uh, the New King James Bible, or the New King James translation, where we read in chapter 13, verse 38, Jesus' interpretation of the parable of the tares. He says, and I quote, The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Now, the reason I read from the New King James is that it reads differently from the original King James. And now, if you'll follow with me for a moment, I'll read from the original King James. In verse 38, we read, The field is the world. That's exactly the way the New King James renders it. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. Verse 40, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Now notice in verse 38, 39, and 40, three times the old King James Version translated uh, the words of Jesus by using the English word world. In the New King James, World is used in verse 38, but in verses 39 and 40, the word age is used instead of world. Now, why is that? Why the change? Well, the simple reason for the change is that there are two different Greek words in the New Testament text that are being translated here. In verse 38, the Greek word is the word cosmos, which is the common word used to describe the world. We talk about cosmic events and so on. That's the Greek word cosmos. Then in verses 39 and 40, we have the Greek word ion, which means age or epoch, not world. Now, I can only guess as to why the original translators of the King James Version translated the Greek word ion by the word world rather than age. My guess is that they assumed, as many have assumed, that when Jesus was talking about the end of the age, he meant the end of the human age, the end of world history. And so translators indicated that in the rendering of the text. But frankly, they shouldn't have done that because of the difference in the Greek words, and the new King James has corrected that uh, somewhat loose translation of, uh, of the original. But that still doesn't solve our problem because the term end of the age could refer, of course, to the end of the human age. It refers to the end of some time period, the end of some epoch. Now again, the question is whether it's the end of history as we know it, or is it more particular and definitive with reference to the Jewish age? Well, again, we have to ask the question, to assume the possibility of a distinction between the Jewish age and the human age, uh, we could be open to the charge of just being engaged in unbridled speculation and uh, creating out of thin air a distinction that the Bible is ignorant of. Now, 
in order for that not to be the case, I think it would be important for us to find in Scripture some reference to the use of this term age that is more particular and more distinctive than to the general concept of the age of human beings or of world history. Now, <clears throat> when we look at Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse, which is found in the 21st chapter of, of his gospel, and I'll turn your attention to that now, we have some details in Luke's version of the Olivet Discourse that are not found in either Matthew's version in Matthew 24 or in Mark's version in Mark 13. And the passage that is most uh, interesting for us in this uh, context, I will uh, read to you uh, beginning at uh, Luke chapter 21, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, but those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. Now remember, I mentioned that uh, early on in this series, that this was contrary advice to what was the universally accepted uh, plan of survival in the case of a military assault or a siege uh, the people would immediately go to the strongest fortified city for their safety and security. And one of the reasons why Josephus tells us that 1.1 million people were killed in the destruction of Jerusalem is that because after the armies of Rome invaded and crossed the borders of Palestine and the word was passed on through the villages and towns, people from all over fled to Jerusalem for safety. But the Christians didn't because Jesus here clearly gives the warning not to do that. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter her, for these are the days of vengeance. Whose vengeance? The vengeance of God is being poured out now upon Jerusalem. These are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those to who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. Again, this is one of the most remarkable future predictions that we find in any surviving literature of any type from any place at any time. One person said, give me one argument for the truth of Christianity. And the answer was the Jews. That the Jewish people have maintained their identity, their ethnic origins, without a homeland for 2,000 years. And they gather on a regular occasion and will say to each other, next year in Jerusalem. I'm of Irish descent. When I was a kid, my parents let me stay home from school on St. Patrick's Day because the radio, popular radio, featured Irish songs all day. My mother sang Irish lullabies to me when I was an infant, when I would go to bed at night, and I grew up memorizing all these things. But as much as they tried to preserve our Irish heritage for two or three generations, we didn't meet around a table saying next year in Dublin. I'm an American. I don't really think of myself as being Irish anymore. But the Jews, despite the loss of their country and their cent center of worship, were dispersed throughout the whole world and never lost their identity. That is unheard of in world history. But it was predicted, that is, the dispersion of the Jews, is predicted by Jesus right here when he said, <clears throat> they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. Now here is the critical verse. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles 
until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now here, Jesus doesn't talk about the Jewish age or the Gentile age. He doesn't use that language. But he speaks about this strange phrase, the times of the Gentiles. Now, simple, elementary deduction. What times of the Gentiles would be distinguished from what other times? Obviously, the Gentiles here is, uh, is a word, the term Gentiles is a word that is used to differentiate Gentiles from, from Jews. And if there are times of the Gentiles, there presumably were former, what, times of the Jews. And so we have a specific interim period in history that is called the times of the Gentiles. Now, I said earlier that there are those who are called full preterists who believe that not only the elements of the Olivet Discourse were fulfilled in the first century, but all of the New Testament uh, prophecies with respect to the future have already taken place, including the final coming of Christ, the great resurrection, the rapture, and all the rest. I don't believe that. But uh, those people who take the position that everything has already been fulfilled in the first century uh, have a problem with this phrase of the times of the Gentiles. And so they include it as a tiny little interim uh, right before the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, say between 69 and 70 A.D., where the Gentiles uh, had a little uh, uh, thing going on in Jerusalem at the time that Josephus tells us about, but I'll skip over that now. When Luke talks about Jerusalem's being trodden underfoot by the Gentiles, until, the word there that is translated until refers clearly to a terminal point. And that terminal point is the fulfillment of the times of the Gentiles. That is to say, Jerusalem will be controlled by Gentiles for a definite period of history, but there will come a time when that will end. And that ending will coincide with the ending of the times of the Gentiles. Am I making myself clear here? that there is a period in history beginning in 70 A.D. where Jerusalem is destroyed, the Jews are dispersed, and this following is time is the times of the Gentiles. But that doesn't go on forever. There is a time when that will be fulfilled. And presumably, that fulfillment will be related to the end of the trampling of Jerusalem underfoot by the Gentiles. Now, just as a matter of parenthesis at this point, let me remind you that what transpired in 1948 with the, the recreation of the Jewish state, the state of Israel, after almost 2,000 years, and perhaps even more significantly, the recovery of the city of Jerusalem from the control of the Gentiles in 1967 with the Seven-Day War, or the Six-Day War, however many days it was, in any case, those two events have triggered perhaps more eschatological speculation than any two events in the last 500 years because uh, of people who are looking for the restoration of the nation of Israel as a supreme sign of the end times. Now, that relates to what kind of position you have on the millennium, and I'll go into that later. But I can remember in 1967 watching the Jewish soldiers 
fighting their way into the center of Jerusalem with their machine guns. And when they got to the Wailing Wall, they threw their guns down and forgot about the firefight, went right over to the, the Wailing Wall and started praying and, and carrying on. And I remember going to an Old Testament scholar that night and said, well, what do you, what do, you do with this? He says, well, I don't know what to do with this. He says, but this is, this is interesting. And that's when Karl Barth said people started reading the Bible in one hand and uh, their newspapers in the other hand. Now, but this is an obscure passage here, and it's the only time in all of it this course of, of the three synoptic Gospels that any mention is made about the times of the Gentiles. But we do have another reference to the times of the Gentiles that's found not in the all of it this course, but in one of the most important didactic chapters with respect to uh, uh, future uh, expectation in the writings of Paul, in Romans chapter 11, where Paul talks about the church being grafted into the original tree or the stump of Israel, and that we who are Gentiles or the Johnny come lightlies, we have been ingrafted into the historic people of God who uh, were, of course, the nation Israel. And Paul says in verse 25 of Romans 11, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, again, there's a lot of controversy in interpreting Romans 11. Some believe that Paul here, when he speaks of Israel, is not describing ethnic Israel. He's not talking about Jewish people. He's talking about the new Israel, the Christian church. Now, I don't hold the view that God has two views and two plans of redemption, one for Israel and one for the church. I don't believe that for a minute. And I do believe that the church in the New Testament is the fulfillment of the covenant people of God known as Israel in the Old Testament. And so I don't divide those two. However, that does not mean that all ethnic distinctions are eliminated. And that Paul here, I believe, in Romans 11, when he just talks about Israel and in the same breath talks about Gentiles, he can only be distinguishing on the basis of ethnicity. So I believe that the Apostle is saying here in draft chapter 11 that God is not done with Jewish people. That there is still another chapter of history that we await where God will once again deal with his people of ethnic origin of Israel. Again, he says, let me read it again. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, that is, the Jews. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So I hear Paul in Romans 11 talking about a future redemptive action with respect to his covenant people, uh, the Jews. Now, in any case, the most important point here is that for the second time we see this phrase in the New Testament, the times of the Gentiles. And if there's any doubt about what it is distinguished from in Luke, there is no doubt about it in Romans, that the times of the Gentiles is a time frame that is distinguished from the times of the Jewish people. And he talks, even as Luke does, of the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled. Now, somebody might want to ask me, well, if that's the case, and if Luke is saying that Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, and it's no longer trodden underfoot, doesn't that mean that the times of the Gentiles are over? 
and uh, we should be at the end? Well, not necessarily, because for one, play, for one thing, though the Jews conquered Jerusalem, they still have much of it that is in the control of, uh, of Gentiles, and the Jews don't have complete uh, domination over the city of Jerusalem. They're sharing it. It's still, in a certain sense, being under foot of Gentiles. So I don't know what that means, whether the Jews will be expelled from Jerusalem tomorrow and we wait another 3,000 years before the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Uh, I doubt that. It certainly does give one reason to pause and say, are we on the brink of some great significant redemptive historical event? Now again, the temptation in every generation is to think that because we all desperately want to see the final consummation of the kingdom of Christ. And, uh, and, and every generation should be diligent and vigilant and have that hope burning in their breast. But for now, I'm just trying to say that if the age of the Gentiles begins in, when we know that the times of the Gentiles begin in 70 AD, if that's the case, would it not follow logically that the times of the Jews or the Jewish age ended in 70 AD? the end of the Jewish age, the beginning of the Gentile epoch, if you will. So that again, the time frame fits year 70, rather than being opposed to it. Now, quickly, before our time is up, I want to uh, give some references of other time frame references that are not by any means exhaustive but uh, that refer to the nearness, expectancy of the last days according to uh, the writers of the Scriptures. In Matthew 10, 12 will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Matthew 26, he spoke, to Jesus was speaking to the high priest. He said, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, for, uh, chapter 13, Now it is high time to wake out of sleep. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. 1 Corinthians 7, the form of this world is passing away. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, critical passage. The ends of the ages have come upon us. Philippians 4, 5, the Lord is at hand. In the general epistles, James 5, 8 to 9, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. 1 John 2, 18, it's the last hour. We know that it is the last hour. And in the book of Revelation, which we'll look at separately, verse, chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ with respect to things which must shortly take place. 1, 3, the time is near. 3, 11, behold, I come quickly. Chapter 22, verses 6 and 7, uh, God's angel shows his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly, and so on. We have a list of reference after reference after reference in the New Testament that calls to the critical situation that the world was in in the first century with respect to the day of the Lord, which was the day of vengeance, of God's visitation of wrath that was tied to some kind of coming of Jesus. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you is that that coming that is described in these passages is not the final coming of Jesus, but it is His judgment coming on Israel. The judgment coming of Christ on Israel. And in our next session, I want to look at some fascinating things that are recorded by the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, in which he gives us a eyewitness account, an eyewitness account of the.